Hello again everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'd like to talk to you about somatoform disorders in children and teenagers. Now in light of the current COVID-19 pandemic crisis that actually we're facing all around the world, it's actually quite timely to discuss somatoform disorders because I think many parents are going to see that maybe because of the stress and confusion and fear that this pandemic is creating, um, their child or teenager may actually develop a somatic symptom disorder. So somatiz somatization, that's a mouthful, is the occurrence of one or more physical symptoms for which appropriate medical evaluation reveals no explanatory physical pathology or pathophysiological mechanism. So basically, despite all the tests, um, they cannot find anything is wrong with the child or the teenager. Now, I think the challenge is, is that in somatic symptom disorder, the child or teenager will have an exceptionally intense response to a physical symptom or symptoms that they th they have. They will think obsessively and excessively about the symptoms. Um, usually they will overuse um, medical care, so frequent visits to the school nurse, to the doctor. And what happens is that they allow the health concerns to directly impact not only their sense of self, but it becomes the focus of their life. So it interrupts social time and school life and family time. Um, it really becomes an obsession. And it's important to note that somatic symptom disorder is not a form of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. However, you can have um, an obsessive com compulsive disorder and then develop a secondary disorder, which is somatic symptom disorder. Now, there are several types of somatoform disorder which are identified in the DSM-5. Um, body dysmorphic disorder, conversion disorder, pain disorder, somatic symptom disorder, which we're actually going to talk about today because it's more common, and differentiated somatoform disorder. Somatoform disorder, not otherwise specialized, EGATS, right? You can see why um, accurate assessment and diagnosis is needed. And then illness, anxiety disorder. And for layman terms, that means hypochondria. So what we find is that in SSD, somatic symptom disorder, the normal everyday aches and pains that most kids have, such as a headache, knee pain, stomach ache. Um, in somatic symptom disorder, it becomes a source of great distress and anxiety and they actually spend a disproportionate amount of time obsessively worrying about this symptom. So let's say, let's say it's a headache um, and it actually leads them to believe that they have a serious or life-threatening disease. So for example, a headache is really a brain tumor. A bruised knee is really, they have um, haemophilia. Um, and so let's say um, you have a child or a teenager now that develops maybe a mild fever or um, a cough or, um, you know, just maybe fatigue. Fatigue is very common in, um, in SSD and they may truly then believe that they have COVID-19 despite even being tested because that would be the first that test that they would use to rule out. They will believe that they actually have this virus. Um, and so what we need to remember is um, these symptoms are very real to the child or to the teenager. They are not imagined, they are not pretend, they are not deliberately doing something to themselves to create this pain, uh, such as Munchausen's disorder. Um, they truly feel this symptom, and the most common symptoms, as I said, are pain and headache and fatigue and generalized aches and pains all over the body or in specifically in a site, abdominal pain, 
um, and nausea. Um, sadly, we have a child that either obsessively overuses the medical system and as I said goes repeatedly for medical attention and medical help and gets every single medical test known to mankind and despite the results coming back that everything is normal seriously believes that this this pain this symptom is going to um, incapacitate them uh, it could be cancer or they could die um, and then on the opposite side, we have the child or teenager who is so consumed and overwhelmed with the thoughts that they actually do have a life-threatening illness or a disease, um, such as cancer, and that they will die, that they absolutely refuse to go and see the doctor because they fear that when that news is confirmed, they, they, it's so overwhelming that they can't even begin to think how they could deal with it and process it. And so I, I ask you actually to be really um, compassionate and understanding and kind when you are trying to help um, your child or teenager who truly believes that their symptom is is a cause of concern and that they could die because of it. Um, just think for a moment, what if you were told that you had the pain in your back was really bone cancer and that you will need all this treatment and that you still may not recover? Um, as an adult, we can think of some stress and anxiety that just that mere thought elicits. So imagine what that's like for a child or a teenager. Now, what we are finding is that somatoform um, or somatic symptom disorder is usually triggered by emotional and mental health issues such as conflict, stress and trauma. So again, I go back to COVID-19. Um, now, obviously not every single child or teenager is suddenly going to develop a somatic symptom disorder. Uh, we have been able to identify that there are some specific risk factors which predisposes a child or teenager to um, having an increased likelihood of developing an SSD. That is genetics. A pre-existing medical condition or illness a pre-existing mental um, disorder, learning disability or neurodegenerative disorder. So think um, anxiety, depression, eating disorder, ADHD, as I said, a learning disability. Um, a child or teenager who has gone through extreme abuse, neglect, adversity, trauma, um, maybe um, a parent or a friend or a grandparent um, had abdominal pain for six months and then suddenly found out they had maybe um, liver cancer and then died. Um, you can see the correlation there as to then if the child develops um, abdominal pain, they, they will go to worst case scenario. And this obsession, much like negative thoughts in our brains, just keeps building up and building up and building up. And there's actually no room for positive self-talk or rationalization. They truly believe it and it becomes part of their life. It actually becomes part of their identity. And then we're also seeing it in kids that have been unable to express their emotions. Um, so they internalize their feelings and emotions because maybe they've been told shut up, you're stupid, that's not true, don't bother me with that, stop crying, you're a baby, things like that. Um, as you know, when we internalize things and we're not given um, a safe outlet to express what we're feeling, what our concerns are, um, and even worst case scenario, we, it just stays inside us and it just keeps building and building. And as more stressful thoughts and as more environmental stresses happen in the in our community it just gets worse and worse and worse now in order to get a diagnosis of SSD um, it's actually quite difficult um, and what we what we've noticed is that um, not every physician is actually able to give an accurate diagnosis of SSD because they don't have the, not the skill set, but I think sometimes they they push it off as it being um, 
a mental disorder, which it actually is, but then they don't follow through with the treatment. They just give them medications or they're they just say, no, you don't, um, and they'll grow out of it, but they actually don't. Um, and so diagnosis is a very thorough and accurate, not only um, a medical history, but also a physical assessment. Um, there will be a cognitive um, assessment done. Um, review all the symptoms, the test results that have been conducted, and they will all be negative. Um, how long has the symptom or symptoms been present? They have to be present for a minimum of six months. And again, six months continued, which is this means daily. And it severely impacts life. So what the DSM-5 did to try and make it easier was they identified three specific criteria that help confirm the diagnosis of somatic symptom disorder in children and teenagers. And it's as I've just said, right? Symptoms are present and continue daily for more than six months. One or more symptoms, physical symptoms that cause problems in daily life. And when I say cause problems in that they impact the child's ability to function. So it could be mobility, sleep patterns, socialization, um, functioning in the family unit, appetite. Um, for example, if they have abdominal pain and nausea, they may not eat. Um, school life, uh, you will find that they usually end up not going to school because their symptoms are so overwhelming that they actually are unable to sit for a whole for a full day in the classroom. And the other thing is excessive and persistent thoughts about the seriousness of the symptom or symptoms with an accompanying persistent high level of anxiety about the symptoms or constant preoccupation with the symptoms and the subsequent health concerns that these symptoms are um, causing. And so, you know, um, I have a headache, I have a brain tumor, I can't go to school, I can't concentrate. The pain will overwhelm them that they are unable to continue in school. And you will see that school work actually suffers significantly. Um, it is a very, very sad and very, very challenging disorder because um, these, these kids have been doing very well and then all of a sudden they are um, sideswiped by a, a tummy ache or a headache or a leg pain which suddenly just takes over them. and they truly, truly, truly believe that there is something seriously wrong and they could die. Now, once the diagnosis is confirmed, there are lots of treatment options and actually they're very successful, which is the plus. So treatment, obviously, we've got to look at individual psychotherapy and of these, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBD, seems to be the most effective. And what CBD does, it helps the child or the teenager identify the thoughts that can fuel the intense reaction and the anxiety. And the goal is to stop the behaviors that worsen the fear, so, such as learn that their thoughts and fears are just thoughts and they're not proof of any uh, physical illness. Now, this is going to take a very long time. This just doesn't happen overnight. Um, it does take a long time, and that's why you need a skilled therapist. But it does start working. And if the CBD is successful, then sometimes the child or teenager may then undergo ERPT. This is a mouthful, so I'm going to read it exposure and response prevention therapy. This actually exposes the child or teenager to the um, fearful thoughts and stresses in a safe environment. And over time, working with the therapist, uh, the therapy aims to gradually diminish the thought's power over the child until they feel in control and they no longer react to the symptoms. As I said, it's a very long therapy and it needs a family approach. Um, it, it's a 24 hour, seven days a week approach to help the child because you have to break this cycle. 
Um, other things, talk therapy, very helpful. Allow the child to open up about their thoughts and feelings and also explore if there has been maltreatment or abuse or neglect, then it's really important that those are addressed and the child is helped to work their way through these thoughts and feelings and enhance their own confidence and sense of self-worth. Exercise and breathing techniques, you need to do those immediately and they are continued at home really helpful um, when the child or teenager starts to have that intense panic and anxiety. Family therapy goes without saying. Um, and then medications are used if the anxiety or the depression is actually quite debilitating. And what we found is that antidepressants such as the SSRIs have found to be very helpful. Now that does not mean that your child is going to be on them for the rest of their life, but once therapy is underway and the symptoms start to, uh, and the behavioral responses start to improve and the thoughts diminish, then you know you can slowly withdraw those under medical supervision. So, <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of parents that are thinking, oh my goodness, where do we begin? The first thing is, you need to be there for your child or teenager and you need to believe what they're saying. Do not minimize it. Do not uh, mimic them. Um, do not invalidate any of their concerns. Their concerns are real and genuine and they believe them and you need to do that. You need to be very supportive and you need to hear what they're saying. Um, don't criticize them. Um, they're not lying. They're not faking it. They're not attention seeking. So encourage your child or teenager to talk about their feelings. What? Why do they feel like this? What do they feel will happen? What's go, what else is going on? What, is there anything that makes them feel better? It's important to maintain a daily routine as much as possible, even if the child is actually disabled at this time, especially if maybe they're unable to walk because of the leg or back pain. And so keep a daily routine, you know, um, chores, family time, meal time, rest periods, time where they could maybe go on their, their computers or laptops or um, their phones to connect with others. Um, try and get the whole family involved. As I said, family, friends, school, need to be aware of what's going on and strategize with them an educational learning plan. Especially if in the interim, the child is at home and can't go to school, then the education needs to continue. So that is important. Um, also, when the child is ready to return to school, again, um, there needs to be a plan to implement. Work very closely with the medical team. Um, as a parent, consider joining a support group online or maybe in person. Um, your child is not the only one and you're not alone. And that will give you an opportunity to air some of your issues and concerns and fears. Um, another thing is spend one-on-one -on -one time with the child or the teenager. Develop a trusting relationship. Um, do things that are meaningful and important and are fun to the child, even if it's for a shortened um, time in the day, um, try and do that. They love going to the movies, go to a movie, or they want to stay at home and watch a silly movie. Even if you don't like the movie, make popcorn, sit with them, spend that time, find out what their interests are, find out what their goals and dreams are. I mean, parents should be doing this period, but more so when your child has a mental disorder and with somatoform disorder, um, they really feel like um, bad things are happening to them. Um, be kind, show love, be understanding. Um, also talk to them, what makes the symptoms better? What makes the symptoms worse? If there's specific foods they want because they feel nauseous or because they don't want their stomach to get worse, then work with them and develop a diet plan because you don't want them to gain weight, but you also don't want them to lose weight, which would commonly happen if they believe that eating a certain food or um, foods will only make the stomach pain worse and feel nauseous. So look at protein drinks and things to supplement them if, you, if you're really concerned about their diet. And it's imperative when um, eating is concerned and that's impacted to work with the nutritionist. I think another thing is if your child or teenager is in school, 
um, work with the teachers and actually work with the team and with the, ch the child or teenager to develop a somatic symptom management plan. So if the symptom um, presents at school and maybe it gets bad, instead of being sent to the school nurse, strategize what other things could be implemented to um, relieve the anxiety and also help the child or teenager take control. Um, as a family, as I've said again, family time very important and the need that the siblings and other family members do not um, intimidate or threaten or belittle or you know mercilessly cheat tease the child no 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 um, they need to understand what's going on and be supportive um, as a family every single day up to four times a day do the breathing and relaxation exercises together maybe at the table when you're about to have a meal or when you're all together like you know everyone before we go about our daily life let's take a deep breath and let's do some daily exercises express gratitude what are we grateful for today what makes us happy what gives us joy work with your child to express their emotions and feelings and concerns in a creative way journaling poetry music art clay modeling um lego construction things like that and um, it's a really good outlet and with the combination of therapist visits that will really help them address some of the root issues the root the core problems here um, I think another thing that we have to remember is if we have some mobility issues um, then you're working with the medical team and the psycho psychological team to develop a plan because you want to get your child back to normal functioning as soon as possible and also back to school. So even if they're maybe on bed rest and they've been unable to move for like three months and they're fearful, um, work with a physiotherapist, range of motion exercises, passive and active that you can do, um, a wheelchair, get them outside to participate in outdoor activities. They can still do chores, bring them into the kitchen, they can wash dishes, load the dishwasher, unload the dishwasher. Um, they need to be back in with the family, back into society, otherwise they become so reclusive and it just gets worse. If mobility is an issue, it's you work with, as I said, the physiotherapist and it's a plan. Today we're going to get you up and you're going to stand up for one minute and you're going to walk five steps. Now, you need to be very mindful. When mobility is involved, it's going to take a long time. And when I take a long time, it may be the plan to get your child to standing and walking normally and aided could take up to two to three months minimum because it de depends on how severe this particular symptom is and how severe it is in the child or teenager's head. Um, and so I think there's a need to be very, very patient. Um, to parents, for your child teenager, I say, validate their concerns, believe the symptoms are real listen to them hear what they're saying be there be present show love for the parents themselves take time out for yourself really use these deep breathing and relaxation exercises because you are going to have to take a long hard deep breath many many times during the day it is challenging it is frustrating there will be days where things are really good and then you, the child or teenager may fall back a little bit. Patience. It will happen. They will get better. They really will. But it's there's no overnight miracle cure. And so I hope that you found this interesting and even if your child does not have SSD, because of what's going on with COVID-19, there are really increased fears and anxieties and stress around this and so work with your child or teenager listen to them um, if they are presenting with some of these symptoms 
get them checked out. You may need to get them checked out two times to have two negative results come back. Many people have done that. But you then work with them immediately to reassure them as a family that this is not a serious illness and that they will be fine. Um, and even if you are in self-isolation, there are very, there are lots of online medical and psychological resources that are helpful, including Dial a Doctor and Dial a Therapist, who can help work you with uh, through some of the challenges that you're experiencing. So to everyone, I say um, during this very difficult time, stay safe, look after yourself, look after your family, reach out to those who need help. You can't go see them, but maybe you can, you know, um, FaceTime with them, text them, email them, phone them, let them know they're not alone. And if we all are kind to one another um, and stand together, we can get through this. Thank you for your time. And next, until next time, everybody, stay calm, stay safe. Thank you.